Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this Maryland online webinar. Uh, for those of you who are joining us, if you could just put in the chat um, your institution, uh, we'd love to, to know where you're coming from. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to moderate this session on generative AI in education, the potential for enhancing teaching and learning. And we're joined by two colleagues from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and I will introduce the, them and then turn it over to both of them. Um, Dr. Tanya Means is the Assistant Dean for Educational Innovation and Chief Learning Officer at Geese College of Business at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. With more than 20 years of experience in higher education, course design, and educational consulting, Tanya has led teaching and learning teams and taught residential, online, and blended courses in entrepreneurship, strategy, technology, and leadership in remote teams. Her research interests include online and blended learning, active learning, learning space design, technology mm -hmm. innovation and teaching, access to digital learning resources, generative AI for education, and faculty preparation to teach. She'll be joined by Adam King, who leads the technology efforts within the teaching and learning, within teaching and learning at the Geese College of Business. With 20 years of experience in higher education, entrepreneurship, and technology, he is passionate about leveraging technology to enable affordable, high-quality business education. And with that introduction, let me turn it over to Dr. Means. Thanks so much, Michael. It's great to be here and uh, really appreciate the invitation. Uh, welcome everyone. And I'm glad that we could have a few minutes to share with you some of the things that we've been playing around with, experimenting at our, at our institution, but also want to encourage you during this session to be able to share ideas that you have or things that you've been experiencing in the chat and we'll also give you some time towards the end of the session for some breakout rooms to talk to each other about some of the things that you're doing. Um, we will also be sharing these slides. You can get them either through um, the, the uh, Bitly link that we've got right here or Adam can throw the, the link itself into the chat as well and encourage you also towards the end when we have our breakouts, uh, we'll have a Google Doc where you can share some of the things that you've discussed. All right, so let's get started. First of all, just thinking a little bit about some of the things that we have learned. Um, we have found that there are, ever since we, you know, OpenAI uh, announced ChatGPT, we've seen a lot of growth and an explosion really in the space. And there's lots of resources out there for either you to learn how to use these tools or even to use tools that other people have created. So there's lots of uh, databases or places where you can go to find um, different tools and uh, artificial intelligence support. And there's really so many uh, applications that we're not going to be able to cover them all. And so we will refer to a few, but also know that there is just so much out there and it changes every single day. I mean, even just last night, I had to go through and change Claude 2 to Claude 3 because that's now come out and all the new things that are coming out with um, in terms of the, the different tools that are available. So I encourage you to just um, spend a little bit of time thinking about that and exploring um, the tools and finding the ones that fit for you. So one of the tools that, um, that we will be talking about a little bit, or one of the ways in which we'll be talking about artificial intelligence a little bit is some of the things that it can do to help you. So even just taking an example of the artificial intelligence and future of teaching and learning report from the Office of Educational Technology, we can throw it into an AI tool and get some insights without having to read this um, fairly extensive report. So for example, we can use the perplexity AI tool, which can give us some recommendations and insights. Um, I even tried using ChatGPT, and um, it was a little bit more basic in some of its responses, but asking more questions, and you'll see this uh, indicated on some of our slides where it says, continue the conversation with ChatGPT. When you're looking at the slides, if you click on that, you can actually go to the thread that we've started, and you can continue to ask questions and, and um, learn more. 
And then even um, the clawed one, basically I tried that one this morning and it said, uh, you've gone over the length limit. So uh, purchase the subscription. And so there's there's lots of tools out there, lots of different ways that you can use it, um, but just thinking a little bit about how you can use these tools in, in meaningful ways. There's a lot of potential for artificial intelligence. And in fact, um, if you plug the, the, the uh, question, what is the potential of artificial intelligence into some of these tools, you'll get a variety of different things that it can be used for. I'm not gonna highlight, I'm not gonna talk about all of them, just we want to highlight a few that we'll talk about in this talk. So we'll talk a little bit about content creation, about media, and about ways that you can provide interventions to help your students. And so we'll kind of um, focus on those today. One of the key things that I want to make sure that we uh, explicitly talk about is the importance of keeping the human in the loop. So that's one of the things you will find if you explore uh, the artificial intelligence report where they talk about the need to keep humans in the loop. It's also one of the biggest worries I think that a lot of people have when they think about artificial intelligence is how is this tool replacing me? And it's really not. Um, I like to think of it as ways of augmenting or complementing the expertise and skill sets that we have. So think about all the different things that you do within your work. You might find some of them to be more mundane or more um, things that could be automated. And some of the things that really need you and your expertise and your experience to be able to um, bring the best to the conversation. And so when we talk about this, we wanna say, let's let the things that machines do well, let's let them do them. They're really great at scanning a huge amount of information and, and summarizing. They're really great at um, trying to pull out things to highlight out of it or um, even with large language models, being able to recommend the kinds of things that would be good responses. But let's also make sure we keep humans doing what they do well. And that is being the, the um, bringing the knowledge and expertise to bear on what the machine has provided, um, being the human component of the face of the content, um, being able to do even more of the critical thinking and things like that. And then through interaction and curation of content, working together. So it's not is one better than the other, but it's how are they working together? If we do that, we'll see a lot of product and productivity gains. We'll see upskilling in our abilities and we'll be able to get a lot more done. So Alex uh, Singla from McKinsey said, for most generative AI insights, a human must interpret them to have impact. And so it's really critical that we keep that human in the loop. And there's also some other quotes. Um, if we talk about some of the things that future, the full-time jobs, um, we found, we've seen some studies that show that um, people with lower level of experience to start with actually gain the most um, growth, most improvement when they start using, when they start being trained in how to use these tools. And so 14% uh, more productivity when low-skilled workers started being trained on how to use these tools. And there's some really great resources that you'll get from these slides just to look at some of the different ways in which we can keep humans in the loop. I don't wanna spend too much more time on that, but just making sure that it's understandable, uh, understood between us. There's also some great resources that I've linked to. And the key thing that I wanna say here is, I don't think, and I agree here um, with the Harvard Business Review, I don't think that AI is ever going to replace humans, but if we as humans know how to use AI, then we will replace those people who don't know how to use AI. So it's really on us to um, take that and, and understand it a little bit more. So I mentioned a few things that we're gonna dig into. One I'll start with is course creation, and then I'll turn it over to Adam to talk a little bit more about some other areas. So within course creation, think of it as, um, a tool that can help you to quickly map out um, an area in which you could teach. So for example, I have taught strategic management. I said, you know, put into a course prompt, help me to develop a course on strategic management. I could do everything from asking it for a course outline. I could then ask for module titles, short summaries of those modules. Um, I could help ask for help with writing SMART objectives. Um, creating formative assignments and specifically linking those to those learning objectives. 
brainstorming and even writing scripts for videos, and then even creating some of the in-text or in-video text and visuals that I want, as long uh, along with, um, once I have that video on my course page, maybe a summary or um, some supporting text that goes with it and enhances the video. And then of course, creating assessments as well. So again, as I mentioned, if you follow these links, either to continue the conversation with ChatGPT, or um, I actually uh, started using Claude 3 yesterday, um, asking Claude 3 for this, you'll get different kinds of results. But let me share a few of them um, that I got. So I asked, ChatGPT to give me some ideas about uh, learning activities for teaching strategic management. Now, I've taught this course many times, and the results that ChatGPT came up with are very similar to the kinds of things that I would have come up with on my own, but it just does it a lot faster. And so I'm able to then go in and fine tune and um, ref uh, refine or make more um, explicit some of the things that I want to talk about. I can also create scoring rubrics. So if I create the assignment and the instructions, I can then create a rubric that matches those assignments and instructions. And I can even tell it how I want to break down that assignment and how I want to score it. And then even ask it to help me create a sample of an assignment that a student might submit and create some feedback that I could use to give to that student to help them improve. So different kinds of assignments. This was the assignment uh, on the left here, the sub, uh, sample student submission. I don't know how many times I have students who ask me, well, how do you have any samples of what students, sh what we should submit? Well, here I can give them a sample um, and then to give them a score. I can also, once I've put together a lot of the content, I can provide a prompt to say, you know, what would make this course better? I've taught the course many times. I know what the students are giving me feedback on. I've kind of figured out some ways that I like to teach it, but maybe there's some other ways in which I could improve it. In fact, if I look at it from the perspective of following the US Department of Education's expectations on regular and substantive interaction, I can get some more prompt or some more feedback or some ideas of ways that I can improve the course. Um, I can also give it a prompt, you know, create a plan for a live session that fits within this module, that includes at least one breakout room activity. I can say it's for a, a, a plan that 130 students might attend, and then a whole lot of other students might watch the recording. So making sure that not only am I thinking about those students who are attending live, but I'm also thinking about the students who will watch the recording and what kinds of ways they can participate as well in order to be able to meet those guidelines. I can even go deeper into the content and I can ask it to write text that goes with the video. And I can be specific. I could say, well, I'd like to have some stories and analogies and I want a quiz that makes sure that they both watch the video and read the content that is surrounded with the, the video itself. So when I do that, I get my story, Tale of Two Cities, and I get my analogies and I get my quiz and even Helpfully, uh, it's got the, the correct answers marked. I can expand it even further and ask for fun activities. And when I first asked this activity, it gave me something that's very specific to an in-person activity, like using um, Lego, Lego blocks or things like that. But then when I ask it to give me a little bit more if I wanted to do it as an online activity, it also was able to give me some ideas for how I could adapt that. And then again, giving a, a prompt to be able to create a rubric. I can specify what kind of criteria I want and the ways in which I want it broken down. And I also mentioned before, I can create a sample student's mission and I can score. And that's what it does here. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam and let him talk a little bit about GPT creation. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. Um, so uh, yeah, we want to cover here custom chatbots and and GPTs. And uh, you know, a GPT is essentially uh, you know a custom chatbot. And it used to be that if you wanted to create your own custom chatbot, um, you need to be a programmer or you need to hire programmers, and it was it was really pretty difficult to do. Um, well, all that has changed, and now really within a matter of minutes, um, you can create a custom chatbot. 
which I think unlocks um, quite a few different possibilities um, for us for us as we as we teach um, our students as, as and as our students learn from us as well. Um, so uh, I wanted to show you what a um, a GPT kind of looks like, um, and so um, uh, taking you know. Um, Tanya's examples previously of, you know, working to create a course, um, creating lessons and modules and lesson plans, etc. cetera. Um, well, we could create a custom chatbot, a custom uh, GPT that could basically, um, that we could reuse um, and, and to do that for us. Um, and so this is an example of a GPT. And essentially a GPT is just a set of text-based instructions. So we write out exactly how we want um, the chatbot to to work. Uh, you know what tone we want it to use, any sort of constraints, any sort of materials that it should leverage, um, and then maybe some guiding um, questions that it should ask us, um, whether it should give us feedback, etc. And so it can be as simple as just two paragraphs of text. You put it into um, uh, if you have a paid account with um, OpenAI, with ChatGPT, you can create this and then uh, you basically have your own custom chatbot. And that can be shared with anyone on your team, with your faculty, with your um, instructional designers, um, provided that they have paid um, ChatGPT accounts. And so that's one of the, um, the drawbacks is that you do need to have a paid account for this. But we'll talk about some, um, some ways around that um, later on as well. So um, there's uh, once you create your GPT, it'll then you can add it to a directory, um, and there are thousands out there, and they're searchable, um, and then others can um, can search for it and find it. And there's uh, there are GPTs really on almost anything, um, and so um, on the next slide, Tanya will show um, the. There's one uh, even called the lazy bot, right? Which uh, basically, you know, can explain any topic to you, um, but in sort of the laziest <laughs> way possible, but not really lazy. It's very, very succinct, right? So really you can have fun with these. Um, you can joke around, um, but you can also get some serious work done too. Um, and so next I wanted to show you um, what some of our faculty have been doing. So um, one of our um, professors, uh, Doug Laney, uh, he teaches a course on infonomics, um, so the uh, economics of information and data strategy. Um, and uh, he's an expert in this field, and he wanted to create um, uh, basically a digital version of himself. So, so he calls this Digital Doug, um, and he used a platform called CustomGPT.ai. It's very affordable, um, and basically what he did was he he loaded all of his um, his books, um, you know, in the platform, his the articles he wrote, uh, the um, the um, I think the podcast that he's done, um, the his LinkedIn activity, etc. He's loaded all that in here and created a digital version of himself, and now anyone around the world um, can basically converse with him about data strategy. And it's free for all the users um, to converse with him. Um, and, and he says that it works remarkably well, and even uh, he feels it answers questions better than he would. Um, so I think that's high praise. Um, and he's created uh, another example, um, this time for a course, where he wanted to essentially um, create a business case, um, a case study on a fictitious company, an online retailer called Nile.com. Uh, and he basically what he did was um, he used that custom GPT platform again, uh, but he created a document, about a 40 page document with background information about this company. And then he told the chatbot, you are a communication specialist for this company, um, and the students are going to be asking you questions. Are going to be interviewing you, um, you know, about uh, some of the um, some of the challenges and opportunities that you see um, within um, your company. And so the students go here; they interact with this um, virtual communications uh, specialist for the company, and then they um, they use the information that they learn here essentially in their case study analysis and their write-up, which they then submit um, in Canvas. So just an example of you know, what's possible um, really in a matter of, of minutes. Um, and so the, the next platform I wanted to show uh, to you here is um, one that um, we've co-developed uh, here at Illinois. It's uiuc.chat. Um, you can go to it right now if you want, and it's it's free to use. Um, and really here we can create any number of um, teaching and learning oriented chatbots. Um, and the the kind of one of the nice things about this platform is 
It has um, various agents, um, so it's very easy to load videos, documents, to connect it to your Canvas course website, to have it scrape, um, scrape the web, so certain websites, um, and you can load system level prompts and basically create your own custom chatbots um, with this platform. And um, it, the way that um, uh, it's free for students or users to interact with these chatbots that you create, but it does use your OpenAI API key. Um, so it will bill you essentially for um, those tokens and that usage that the system will, will have interacting with the um, uh, chat GPT models. Um, and so on the next screen, we've got just a little shot of the interface here. You can see some of the file formats that are um, supported. Again, it's very easy to get started with this. Um, and then I wanted to walk you through an example of um, what you could do on a platform like UIUC.chat. So, you know, a chatbot um, can really, you can do any number of things with a chatbot. Um, you could do learning games, you could do simulations, you could do role-playing exercises, um, and um, you could do tutors, um, help bots, coaches. And here's an example of a guided assignment. Um, so what we did here is, um, so in a marketing course, um, one of the, um, key uh, skills that they teach is how to create a positioning statement. Um, it's it's very important for marketers to be able to do this, um, but it's kind of formulaic. You know, it's there's there's definitely a formula to how you create a positioning statement, um, and it's um, it's a low stakes assignment in the course. Um, you know, it's something that you want the students to get feedback on, but you don't necessarily want to put too much time into giving individualized feedback to each of the students because, you know, there are all sorts of other assignments in the course too, right? Um, but the key here really is for the students to be able to practice and get hands-on uh, creating their own positioning statement. And so um, with this platform, you can basically create a chatbot that will guide them through that process. And so here's an example, you know, we set up some parameters about the persona and how it should answer. And then we tell it how to start the conversation, um, what questions to ask the student, when to give feedback, et cetera. And so there's basically 12 steps here. The students interact with it. And on the next uh, slide, you'll see a little preview of what that looks like. Um, and so you can see, you know, here I'm crafting a positioning statement for our online MBA program. Um, and, you know, I put in some very short responses and then it's saying, okay, you know, that's a good start, but we're getting closer. Here's some ways you can improve things. Um, and it, it can be fully conversational as well. Um, so at one point it asks me um, to define, you know, to provide the competitive frame um, for our online MBA program. And I'm like, well, what, what, what is that? What is a competitive frame? And I can just ask the bot here and um, it'll tell me what the competitive frame is. And then I can continue the conversation. And then at the end, I end up with a really nice, well-crafted positioning statement that I can then use and then submit um, as my assignment in Canvas as a student. Um, so I think, I hope, I hope this kind of inspires you to think about, you know, maybe some other ways that the students could interact um, you know, with some of the learning material that you have. And, um, you know, in many of our courses, uh, we have um, quite a, a large repository of videos that we've produced. Um, so some courses have hundreds of, of video lectures that we've produced for Coursera and other platforms. And we were thinking, well, how can we leverage, you know, all of that content? Um, how can the students, you know, kind of use it as reference material and, um, you know, get to the information that they're looking for. Um, and so we created a chat bot called iReplay. And essentially um, this is an example of a course where, a course on microeconomics, where we loaded um, all the, the videos for that course. Um, and then we use that to train this chat bot. And so the students can come in and they can ask questions. Um, so here, you know, I've asked a question and I even made a typo in this question, um, but it's no problem for the chat bot. So what's the difference between a change in demand and a change in quantity demanded? Uh, typical kind of question you'd have in an economics course. And then the chat bot is leveraging those videos and providing me with information um, on that. And then it's citing 
um, and, and providing links to those videos where I can then take a deeper dive um, as well as related concepts. And all those I can click through um, and verify the answer as a student um, and learn more as well. Uh, and then on the next screen, we'll show you kind of what one of those videos looks like. And so you can see it's brought me in this video, there's three segments that's identified that are pertinent to that question I asked. I can click right there and then I can get to that video segment where the professor covers that material. And then um, the there another platform um, that's been spun out here from our uh, College of Engineering and our Disruption Lab is Arist AI. Um, and I wanted to bring this up because um, it was developed and inspired from a PhD student here at Illinois, um, Ji Hang Jing. And so, um, you know, he had, an, he had an experience as a TA and as an international student, um, you know, uh, before that, that he saw some, some things that could be improved, right, in office hours and lab sections. He often saw students that would, you know, ask the similar questions. Um, he saw that students often needed to be led to the right information. So they already had that information, but they didn't really know how to find it. Um, and then he also saw and felt himself that students were often afraid to ask questions and then they weren't seeking help. And so um, he created this company, Arist AI, which um, essentially can become um, a virtual TA for a course and help answer those questions that the, the students have. Um, so I, I, I hope that, you know, you're starting to see kind of what, what's possible here um, with these custom chatbots that, you know, maybe, um, you know, a year ago would have been very hard to do, um, but now really in a matter of minutes, if you write out a couple paragraphs of instructions, um, you can create your own custom chatbot and create any, uh, any number of learning activities and um, assistants and helpers um, for your courses. And so um, with that, I wanted to turn things back over to Tanya and we can go way beyond just text here um, with AI. Thanks, Adam. Um, so yeah, I wanted to share a little bit more about some of the potential for media. And I really want to recognize that um, everything that you see happening with media in uh, these generative AI tools is it's just really taken off. I mean, if you even recognize that less than six months ago, we were looking at videos um, that were really awkward, cringy, uh, you know, very unrealistic. And we were seeing things that, you know, I can't imagine how I would use this in any serious uh, use of, of content. Even in just the last few days, we've started to see some really incredible, realistic um, and uh, amazing ways in which media can be impacted by generative AI. So I wanna share just a few of them. Um, so at one point when we first started out, uh, some of the people were saying, you know, these tools can't, they can't, um, read images, they can't understand images. And so let's let's use images to um, to you know ensure academic integrity or things like that. Well, we've gone so far beyond that to even where we can ask with just a, a simple text prompt to create images. And so you you know this one is more of a an artistic looking image, but we also see a lot of potential for things like um, photorealistic images as well. Um, but even just if you are wanting to illustrate a point or be able to grab an image uh, or create an image that uh, that kind of encapsulates the content that you're trying to put across, it's really uh, straightforward to put in a simple text description and get a variety of different images that you can then um, refine to make something that you can use. Uh, and we also see the ability for these generative AI tools to understand really complex images. So this is just one example of a very complex image. I can load that image into ChatGPT and I can say, explain this diagram and I will get a very detailed and um, descriptive uh, set of texts that will help me to try and understand that, that concept even further. 
Um, we also can very quickly and easily with a variety of different tools generate images. Um, Adobe has their um, Firefly tool that can very quickly take text to image or even generative fill to be able to uh, expand an image. Uh, we can create images of a variety of different, um, even whimsical kinds of things. Uh, I put in a request for a hamster eating a dandelion and got lots of different options. I could put it in saying I want it on a beach with a hat and um, I, no need for me to take my hamster out of my cage and, and run it to a beach and take a picture of it if that's what I want. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of opportunities there in terms of those types of creations of very realistic looking um, images. I am not an artist, um, but I was playing around with uh, a couple of tools and, and realized that I could take a very simplistic paint drawing that create, that I created with my mouse and um, put it into ChatGPT and get a really pretty close representation um, in, a, in a very beautiful way in less than seconds. I mean, it was just a very quick response to be able to get something. And then if I didn't specifically like that one, I could always build on it and get an even uh, more refined or more realistic kind of image. So I could get even more details just by putting a little bit more of a prompt to be able to get something more. Now I can take something like that and I can even uh, share my, my, uh, my stick figure and I can say, you know, take this image and, and generate something that's more realistic. And okay, so I didn't really want a girl running in a dress. That wasn't what I had shown, but I can use some more, uh, some more prompts and be able to get something a little bit not so realistic, uh, <laughs> uh, but then um, with a little bit more refinement, actually able to generate something that really is pretty, um, pretty close to realistic. So there's uh, quite a few things that we can do in terms of generating images. One of the other things we've been playing around with here is uh, trying to be able to generate realistic um, digital twins or avatar of, of of some of our um, faculty. We've put out a course where we have about 10% or 15% of the course is created using an avatar from a company called Synthesia. And I'm, 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 there's no sound that you need to worry about, but I'm gonna just play this and see if you can guess and you can just throw your, uh, throw your guess into the chat, which one, whether you think the one on the left or the one on the right, one with the eye pin or one without the eye pin is the real professor and which one is the avatar. I'll let it play for just a, a minute there. And we'll start seeing some votes of who you think is the real professor. So any guesses? Okay. Got one for on the right, one for on the left. Some more on the right, more on the left. All right, so we'll go here and the one on the left was the avatar. So those of you who said the one on the right was the real professor is that art, those are actually correct. Um, but I will tell you that almost every time that I share that video, I would say about 85% of the people say that the avatar is more real looking than, than the one that is the real human. So we created this um, video where the professor introduces the course and the everything from the script that was used for the video to the avatar that is speaking the video to the images and um, uh, visuals that you see in the video were all created with different tools from AI. So in thinking about doing that, um, one of the things that we've been talking to our faculty about is what does this help us do? In some ways, um, some faculty might feel threatened. Well, are you just taking away me? Um, but in other ways, a lot of faculty are starting to recognize some of the benefits of it. So I'll just share a couple of them. One, as we've just seen Michael post in the chat, is the idea that we can use another generative AI tool to um, allow Professor Bruner to be able to speak languages he's never even dreamed of speaking. So he could speak Mandarin and um, French and 
um, any number of languages. So that's one option is to be able to serve our global learners even more. A couple of other options are to reduce the time needed to spend in the studio. So the professor would write the scripts and those scripts can then be fed into the, the tool. The tool produces those videos without needing to spend time in the studio other than the 20 or 30 minutes that it takes to train the tool. Um, some of the other things that it benefits, uh, that it gives us the opportunity to do is to be able to say, well, about 17 minutes in the video, I made a mistake. I said X when I meant to say Y. Well, in historically, we would either need to, depending on how much of that content needed to be replaced, we would either have to re-record the whole video or we would have to use a tool like Vscript that would overwrite the words, but it was not quite um, natural. And uh, we could only do that if it was a very small amount of content. So in this case, we can just fix the script, load it again, and we have a new video version of the, of the uh, without having to go back into the studio. Some of the other potential ways that this can be used in the future is to be able to um, reuse content. Uh, maybe 10% of the video needs to be replaced in a year. We don't actually have to replace the video. We can just replace the script with the new content and regenerated video. Or to be able to allow students to even a little bit further in the future to be able to pause the video and ask a question and have the video respond fluidly to their question. So there's lots of different ways in which um, using these kinds of tools can do so much more than the actual um, typical recorded video that we've done in the studio in the past. We're also seeing some advancements in the way that ChatGPT itself is more responsive. So um, even just earlier uh, or late last year, um, ChatGPT was uh, rolled out so it could see things. You could take a picture of it, ask it to interpret the picture. It could hear, so you could actually speak to it and it could speak back to you verbally. I won't actually demonstrate this, but I'd encourage you to go and take a look because um, those capabilities allow you to have a really pretty natural conversation with ChatGPT itself. So it's basically an interface on your phone. Uh, you pop up, you ask a question, and the re response is um, ChatGPT responding to you verbally with your question, where you can interrupt, you can ask a new question, and keep having to go back and forth um, and have that conversation. And now, um, even in just the last few weeks, we're starting to see some really uh, major advancements in being able to do text to video or even reference images to video. So uh, if you follow the links and be able to look at these later, if you've heard of Sora, um, Sora is the chat GPT tool that can generate pretty realistic looking video. Now, there's definitely some places where you can tell that it's not um, completely real, but there's also a lot of ways in which it's very difficult to tell that it's not real. I mean, you look at things like the textures and the lighting and the way in which the, the um, generated uh, visuals move or um, react to other visuals in the video. The ones that I have on the right here, um, one of them is, um, the Mona Lisa singing a song. And the one on the bottom is uh, an AI generated um, drawing speaking. And they both um, sound and look uh, quite realistic. Uh, one of the key things to remember, I think I said in the beginning is that um, these tools are only getting better. And so what we see now with very critical eyes and are looking at and saying, you know, well, that's not quite right. Maybe the arms aren't quite moving for, uh, correctly or the mouth isn't exactly perfect. This is the worst that we're ever going to see. So even day to day, everything is constantly improving to a point where it's going to be so realistic that even if we know it's AI, we're gonna have a hard time distinguishing whether or not it is. All right, so um, what I would 
I guess the biggest thing that I could recommend to you is we've shared with you lots of different ideas and we're going to share a couple more with you. But one of the key things to recognize is that the only way that you will be able to um, understand how these tools work or to be able to know what they can or can't do is to actually play with them yourself. So we've provided some links to different tools that you can try, some of which are free, some of which if you get a paid mode, you can do a little bit more. Um, and the important thing to recognize as you're exploring them is that just like we got used to using Google or Wikipedia to be able to seek information, we could put in a request either to the Wikipedia uh, search or to the Google search or any of the other tools that we previously had access to. We could put in a search and we would get results, but there wasn't really any way to refine that result to make it match more what we wanted. Now with these tools, that's what we can do. <laughs> and so the main thing that I wanna stress here is that generative AI is interactive. If you just ask a question, and you get a response and you don't like it, that's not the end. You can go back and ask more questions. You can ask it to refine it. You can ask it to do more. And so that's the thing that um, I wanna be able to, to really stress is that your initial prompt is just the start. You really need to think in an iterative, iterative, sorry, iterative way. So you need to be able to put in a, a prompt and then if that what you get back isn't what you were expecting, put in a new prompt and back and forth until you get what you're looking for. You can also ask once you get a response for more or different types of information. So this isn't the same as iterative. It's more like how do you structure that prompt? So Adam shared a couple of different ways in which you could put in really detailed prompts. So it's thinking about those prompts in a way in which you're trying to refine and uh, limit the scope to what you need. I really like this idea of using these tools as scaffolding. So explain it like I'm five. Now I understand it like I'm five. Explain it like I'm 10 or 20 or explain it like I have a PhD. So we can get from the very uh, most simplistic mode all the way up to a much more advanced which also allows us to be very personalized in how we get information. I also encourage you and um, encourage you to encourage others to use these tools with everything. If you do that, what you will start to recognize is where it works well and where it doesn't work well. And even where it works well now, it didn't used to. And so just think about it from the learning mindset. If you're trying something, it doesn't work today, it might work in a couple of weeks or in a month. Um, use it to create things that have complexity, not just the most simple things, but if you um, ask it to analyze an image or to create something or to analyze a file or to um, create a file, um, there's lots of different ways in which you can um, use it for more complex types of work. And then again, as I said before, today is the worst version you will ever see of generative AI. It is constantly improving. And it's not only constantly improving the tool itself, but it's constantly improving in the way other people use the tools to leverage to create new tools. Um, so Ethan Malik writes uh, a lot about generative AI and I really liked how he described generative AI as an intern. So if you think about it as being good at some things, very productive, eager to please and learn what you want, it's sometimes not gonna be able to do it and may lie. And so you have to be able to tell the difference. You have to be able to push on it a little bit. It's also gonna be a little bit quirky and naive and idiosyncratic in how it responds. And so getting used to that and recognizing if you think of it not as a tool that's broken, or that doesn't do what you want, but it's more getting to understand how it works. And then Ethan Mollick also provides this um, great way of thinking about it. Is it a just me task? Is it a task I can delegate? Is it a centaur task, which is more like part me and part the AI? 
or is it something that I can automate that will um, that will be able to do things without me even re reviewing it? All right, I'm going to turn it over to Adam to talk even a little bit more about some of the ways in which it can be used to um, help with teaching. Yeah, so continuing that that thread of you know how to experiment um, with uh, these various technologies. Um, uh, kind of more in the um, the area of providing feedback and um, you know creating assignments for students. Um, we've created a series of resources here that you can check out. Um, you know maybe after um, this session here today, um, and so um, um, we'll have a series of links for you that you can check out in the slides. Um, and so one of these is, um, for instance, on how to create uh, GPTs. So there's a help article there which just goes through, you know, how to create one. It's a great place to start. Um, and then we've um, linked to some full examples um, that, um, you know, are fairly interactive. So, for instance, an interview coach um, and then a business model master. So, um, you know, walking you through uh, more of an entrepreneurial exercise of, you know, how you, you might create a, uh, a business plan um, and business model for a new venture. Um, and so you can view the full kind of scripts behind those, the full recipes, if you will, or instruction sets for creating those. And then maybe that'll inspire you to create um, some guided assignments um, of your own. Um, and um, uh, we've also linked to some starter conversations in ChatGPT, um, for instance, on um, how to create, uh, you know, milestones for a certain assignment, um, how to interact with a um, uh, with the chat bot to improve a rubric. Um, so having that back and forth of, okay, here's here are my assignment instructions, here's my rubric, here's a sample submission or generate a sample submission for me um, and now grade it. And then you can start to see maybe some holes in your rubrics or some ways to improve your rubrics. Um, and then, you know, how to provide feedback to your students. So, um, you know, if you're seeing that students, for instance, are having trouble with a certain area, um, within their assignments or the questions by, by the questions that they're asking you. Um, we've got some examples here on how to leverage um, ChatGPT um, to, to help you provide feedback to those students. So lots of resources here to dive into. Um, and then next, um, we're going to um, have a little bit more of a discussion on um, how to use these uh, technologies. All right, Michael, here's where you can put some people into some breakout groups and we'll have a little bit of discussion. Here's the prompt. So we're gonna give you about five minutes in the breakout room. And here's a few ideas of things that you can talk about. Obviously you can talk about other things if you're interested in those as well. And then when we come back, we'll answer some of the questions that were in the chat as well as pull out some of the ideas um, of uh, what people have talked about. I apologize, I didn't get the rest of the bullet point in um, for the last one about the Penn State example. Um, I will try and fill that in for the slides for those of you who follow up afterwards. But basically I've been working with an instructor at Penn State to put together um, some assignment activities where they're generating images and talking about the ethics of AI and the ethics of those images um, as part of their class assignments. And then we'd love to have you share with each other some of your experiences and some of the things that you've been doing. And we've got a Google Doc here that you can link to. Uh, Adam, if you wanna throw the link in the chat as well, that will give people to the ability to um, record their information into the Google Doc. And then um, hopefully those who are watching the recording as well can continue to add to that Google Doc and share more of what their uh, experiences have been. So I think, uh, Michael, if you want to go ahead and open up the breakout rooms, we'll give everybody about five minutes in the breakout rooms to talk, and then um, we'll come back and wrap it up. Okay, I'm going to include the uh, co-host when assigning. So if you're a co-host and you want to come back to the main room, that, that's fine. Uh, but because of the number of participants, I think we'll have three breakout rooms, about four people in each. Great.
Thanks, Mike. I, I mean, I could go in, but they're, you're, they're, oh, and I should. You haven't got to the questions. <laughs> we have one group that's still talking. Yeah. <laughs> We probably could all have continued talking. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much to talk about. <clears throat> all right, I'm gonna put the link also to the Google Doc in um, the chat again. If you get a chance to, we'd love to see your ideas and the things you discussed with each other in that Google Doc. I also uh, recognize that there's a whole lot of questions in the chat that we're probably not going to be able to get to to cover all of them. Um, but Adam and I will go through the questions. Um, and Adam, you want to grab the chat real quick, save it, and we'll um, we'll add our responses into the Google Doc to be able to follow up with everybody. So I was hoping we'd have a little more time for break, uh, for a report out, uh, but I don't think that we really will. So I want to just um, wrap up with a couple of things. One is that there's no one right way to use these tools. There's lots and lots and lots of different ways. And in fact, um, even from what you will do, from what someone else will do, there's lots of experimentation and ways in which you can adapt it. Um, but there's also a lot of ways in which you can find success. And so what we would encourage you to do is just keep playing with it, exploring, experimenting, and talking to other people because uh, the more that you work together, with each other, uh, the more you're gonna find success. Um, I've got our contact information here and um, feel free to follow up with either Adam or I, and um, we'd be happy to have more conversations with you. And as I promised, Adam and I will go through the Google Doc and be able to, or put in some responses to your questions and the things that you brought up as we were discussing. Adam, any final thoughts? No, just uh, thank you very much. And I, I think uh, Michael may have a slide here that um, um, he's he's going to want to put up. Yeah, let me stop my share. There we go. Yes, thank you. This this was fascinating. Um, and I think you generated a lot of ideas for people to, to go and play. Um, I, I know I've made a lot of notes on the tools I'm going to use to go go play with. Um, and I, I'm sure my colleagues on the call are going to do the same. So Tanya and Adam, thank you very much. It's It's been a pleasure. Uh, I do want to put a, a screen up um, or, or share a screen for those who need um, professional development credit or are looking for professional development credit. You can um, take a screenshot of, of this slide and um, submit it to your the department that'll give you professional development credit. So with that, I, I wanna thank everyone for coming. Uh, please use use that Google Doc. I think it's a great opportunity to share ideas. Um, and, and we wanna thank again, Adam and Tanya for joining us. Would you Absolutely. put that screen back up, Mike? Sure. It wasn't fast enough, I'm sorry. Not a problem. I am not seeing it. There you go, Mary. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care, Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.